morning. It's good to see y'all this morning. Welcome. We're going to start this morning with a couple songs. So if you can stand, if you're able, you can stand. If you don't want to, that's fine as well. But let's uh, sing together. Worship the Lord. Punishment that brought us 
good singing. Uh, you can have a seat if you'd like to. Um, as we get underway this morning, or we continue uh, underway, um, would somebody like to give thanks to God for our time together this morning? Steve, can I call on you to do that? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We can gather together and worship thee. And give further words that guide us down the path of life. Lord, you is everything from the whole creation, our creation, and the prayer we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink. And you, most of all, you give the chance for salvation, the chance for eternal life with you. Let us uh, go out today from this learning experience here at church and uh, spread that word and do that way. Amen. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, our scripture reading, or not our scripture reading, but our uh, read and response this morning uh, is going to be in the blue book, the hymnal. Uh, so if you want to take one of those out, pick it up, and uh, open to number 785, 785. <clears throat> this one has a part for everyone, and it has a part for the men, and it has a part for the women. So uh, we're going to read 785. I'm going to read the part of the worship leader. Everyone will read the part of everyone, and I trust everyone will know what else to do. Yep. All right, so beginning there, life everlasting. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. All right. Excellent. Good. <clears throat> Today we are continuing in our study through Romans, uh, the book of Romans. And if you want to, uh, if you didn't bring your Bible with you, there's a white book in the seat pocket. Uh, you can grab that. That's uh, the Bible that we use here. And uh, again, we're continuing our study through Romans this morning. Now, just a few reminders as we pick up for today. Romans is a letter that was written to the church in Rome, Italy. Right? It was written by the Apostle Paul about three years before he was able to get there and see them in person. He didn't know everybody in the church, right? He knew some people through acquaintance, but by and large, he had never been there. He didn't know the people of the church, but he did know about uh, certain issues that existed because they were very common to the churches in his day. Uh, they were Jewish and Gentile issues, right? You have Jewish believers who've come to faith in Christ. You have Gentile believers who are not uh, Jewish by background, and they've come to faith in Christ. And you have two different groups of people who have been brought into the same family of faith, right, through Jesus Christ. Uh, so he deals with several of these things throughout the letter, but his main purpose is to, in a very systematic way, explain the gospel. What is essential to faith in Jesus Christ? What is not essential? And how do believers deal with one another 
on essential matters and non-essential matters. And today we're going to be in Romans chapter 9 looking at what's being said about our responsibility, right? We'll be in Romans chapter 9 looking at what's being said about our responsibility. So as we prepare to do that together this morning, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can call you Father, that though you are righteous and holy and we are not, that we can come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, who's done everything necessary to bring those who believe into your family, uh, to give them uh, the status of a son or daughter in your household. And uh, we're grateful to you for this, uh, eternally so. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you choose to reveal yourself through your word, that you represent yourself by your word, and that we can know you because you have given us your word. We can trust you also because you do everything that you say. Uh, Lord, as we come to your word today, help us to uh, understand the things that you're making plain and clear. Help us to take the conviction that you give through your spirit. And Lord, I pray that as a messenger of your word, I would speak it faithfully. I ask this in you, Jesus. Amen. All right, so as I mentioned, we'll be finishing Romans chapter 9 today. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 33. And uh, if you're using one of the Bibles in the seat pocket, I think that's around page 962 or 963, somewhere in there. And as usual, I'd just like to go over a little background information before we read that helps us all understand where we're coming into things today, all right? Now, something that's helpful to know about the church in Rome, as I mentioned, is that there were both Jewish believers and Gentile believers. There was a much larger number of Gentile believers, folks who were not Jewish in background. Uh, Gentiles is a word that means the nations, Uh, So people from uh, every type of background other than Israel. There was a smaller number of Jewish believers. And so Paul deals with some key issues that are pertinent to both. Now, throughout Romans, Paul is concerned to show that the gospel is in complete continuity. It's in complete agreement, complete alignment with the Old Testament revelation of God. That's because Jesus is God, and God always promised that he himself would save his people. At the start of chapter 9, Paul begins answering a particular question. If Jesus is the Savior that God always promised to his people Israel, why have so many Jews rejected him, yet so many Gentiles have received him? Right, that's the question that Paul began answering at the start of chapter 9. It's this question that he's continuing to address as we join in uh, here at verse 14. So picking up there, uh, let's read. <clears throat> what should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, so that I may display my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then God shows mercy to those he wants to, and he hardens those he wants to harden. Well, you'll say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, desiring to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of wrath ready for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on the objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory? 
on us, the ones he called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As God also says in Hosea, I will call not my people, my people, and she who is unloved, beloved. And it will be in the place where they were told, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. But Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of Israel's sons is like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved, for the Lord will execute his sentence completely and decisively on the earth. And just as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel, pursuing the law for righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law? Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but they pursued it as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Look, I am putting in Zion a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. Yet the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. All right. <clears throat> so what all is being said there, right? What exactly is Paul talking about? Uh, yes, sir. That's right. When Jacob come back and Esau forgave him and accepted him back, is Esau coming to the flock or was he always rejected? Well, that's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that. I didn't even know why. <laughs> yeah. But I'm sure God does. Okay. Just yeah. curious if, that was, if I was missing something there. Yeah. You know, the, the point that... Um, Paul is making, and if I didn't make this clear last week, I'll make it clear now. The point that Paul is making with that is that God was selecting through whom he was going to operate in history in order to bring uh, people to himself. And without uh, Jacob or Esau having done anything good or bad, right or wrong, God selected one of them in order to fulfill his promises through and not the other. All right, so it does not depend on human works, but it depends on the one who calls. All right, so um, thanks for bringing that up, Steve. And uh, we're going to touch on it a little bit more in today's message. But, um, you know, if we look at what we've read, right, and we try to get our minds around what's being said here, <clears throat> at this stage of the letter, Paul has begun dealing with the questions or the question of how to understand the nation of Israel in the age of the church. Uh, he devotes chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans to this particular topic, so it's good to see them all as a unit. Uh, first, in chapter 9, Paul shows that God never promised to save every single ethnically Jewish person. In fact, he said well in advance that many of them would reject him. And he told about the inclusion of the Gentiles well ahead of time in his word also. Second, in chapter 10, Paul's going to show uh, that the law of Moses, the laws of Moses, and all of God's promises have been completely fulfilled in Jesus. Um, in chapter 11, then, Paul is going to get to the fact that God will eventually save all Israel, but all Israel, he's already said, doesn't refer to every single Jewish person. It refers to every person who has faith in Jesus. All right? <clears throat> so, again, what Paul's doing in the section that we read is it's speaking directly to the large-scale rejection of Christ by the majority of Jewish people. Now, the word, uh, the, the word Christ and the word Messiah, uh, you'll see them sometimes interchangeably, or you'll, you'll hear them interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Messiah is the Hebrew word. Christ is the Greek word. Both of them mean anointed one. Uh, both of them are referring to the Savior God would send. So <clears throat> we have this issue where the majority of Jewish people have rejected the Messiah. 
and the, there's an overwhelming growth of the church among the nations. So this is, uh, this is again, the issue that uh, Paul is dealing with. And as usual, what we're going to do is go back through this in more detail, what we've read. And I'm going to make and discuss the following points today. That salvation depends on God's mercy, verses 14 through 18. That God is in control, verses 19 uh, through 29. And that human works do not save, uh, verses 30 through 33. So with that, let's review 14 through 18. Uh, Picking back up there, the scripture says, What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it doesn't depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, so that I may display my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, God shows mercy to those he wants to, and he hardens those he wants to harden. It's a nice little summary statement there at the end of what Paul's talking about. All right, so what's being said here? It's helpful to remember that in Romans, Paul is using a style of writing where he asks and he answers questions. He anticipates the objections or the questions that people might have based on what he's just said, and then he asks the question that's probably in their mind, and he answers it, right? He's doing that here. Uh, Based on what Paul has just said ahead of this, that God chooses people not based on anything good or bad that they've done, but based on his sovereign decision, and using the example of Jacob and Esau, right, that Steve pointed us to from last week, that while they were both still in the womb, while neither one of them had done anything good or bad yet, God announced, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, or Jacob I have accepted and Esau I've rejected. Someone might say, based on hearing this, well, is that really fair? I mean, come on, Esau never even had a chance, right? This might be what was in Steve's mind. Esau never had a chance. Maybe when he reconciled with his brother, didn't he get back in somehow that way, right? If God is supposed to be just, if he's supposed to always do what's right, then how exactly is that right? Right? Can you imagine people thinking those things? I hear people ask those questions today. If God is good, then why do bad things happen, right? If God is just, then why is there the stuff in the world that's not fair? Well, Paul answers this objection by pointing to two examples. God himself says in Exodus 33, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And with Pharaoh, king of Egypt... God raised him up to that position of power, and he tore him down, all in line with God's purpose of making himself known as God. You know, a little language in history that helps out with understanding this is name in the Bible, like when you hear, uh, in my name, right, so that my name will be proclaimed in all the earth, or to pray in Jesus' name, name in the Bible refers to more than just what you call somebody. It's used to talk about who they are as a person. It refers to them in their entirety, their presence, their authority, right? So we should understand that that's what's being talked about here. When God says, I raised you up so that I may display my power in you and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth, verse 17, we should understand God was doing this so that Pharaoh would see and the whole world would see there's only one true God, only one real power, only one real authority, only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. There's only one God, and the Lord your God is Lord alone. All right, that's uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Pharaoh, as the ruler of Egypt some 3,500 years ago, right, from where we are in time right now, 3,500 years ago is when all this was happening, 
right? Pharaoh, as the ruler of Egypt some 3,500 years ago, believed himself to be the human representation of Ra, who was the sun god. You know, like the sun in the sky that gives light and heat, right, that divides day from night. Basically, Pharaoh thought of himself as God, and the people in Egypt were taught and came to understand that Pharaoh is the human representation of Ra, the sun god. But God, right, who is God over all, showed that this was not true. The point being, God chose Pharaoh to come to power just as God had chosen Jacob instead of Esau. And these choices are completely God's right to make. He alone has the power and the authority to do these things. Now, if we would go back to verse 16 then, we see the scripture says it does not depend on human will or on human effort, but on God who shows mercy. Now, what's the it, right? It doesn't depend on human will or effort. What's the it? The it is God's choice of who he'll save and who he won't, whom he'll show mercy to and who he will not. So as verse 18 says, so then God shows mercy to those he wants to, and he hardens those he wants to. And it brings us to the first point that I'd like to make today, which is this. Salvation depends on God's mercy. Salvation depends on God's mercy. The situation of all people is that we are sinners by birth and by choice. We're born, each of us is born into a fallen world. We each make our own active choices for sin as well. And the fact of the matter is not one of us is saved apart from God's choice to show mercy to us. Let me bring you back to Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means all, right? There's a simple definition for all that I learned. It's very helpful. All means all, and that's all, all means, right? Every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they fell from His grace. They fell into sin. And the world fell also. We've each inherited a corrupted body and soul and a nature, an inner person, a will, and an environment in which we live that are all inclined towards sin. But on top of this, we're each guilty of our own sins, right? You're not just guilty of what you have inherited, but you are guilty of what you yourself have done. As soon as people know any better, we actually choose to sin. At times it's unintentional, at other times it's deliberate. We know what we're doing wrong and we still do it. When the Bible talks about sin, it means not only the bad things that you think and you say or you do, right? but the things that you feel, right, that are even not right. And it's talking about the effect, uh, not just the effect that your actions have, but it's talking about uh, the fact that this entire existence is affected by sin. Uh, There's a corruption that's been brought about in the world and in each of us, and it results in death. Sin is sometimes thought of as an out-of-date term, right? Antiquated, old-fashioned. But the Bible's, it's the Bible's diagnosis for what's deeply wrong with people and with this planet. There's evil in the world and in each of us. Things are off the mark in small ways and very big ways. Things are not functioning right for us, and they are not functioning right for the world. It doesn't take a whole lot to look around and see that. This existence is not the way it's supposed to be. Our bodies age, they get sick, injured, and die. Live long enough, see enough, you'll figure that out. Our world is aging. It is also getting sick, 
being injured and it will eventually die, pass away. The only rescue is the one God provides and it only comes as a result of his choice to show mercy. But if all are in need of rescue and God simply chooses some and he does not choose others, well, how is that just? How is that fair? How is that right? In other words, is justice actually being done? That's the question that's being asked here, and it's the one that Paul is answering. All right? So what I want to do is discuss justice and mercy for a moment. Justice has to do with a crime being punished. Mercy has to do with a criminal being spared punishment. Like if someone ran a red light and killed another driver, that would be a crime. And you would expect that the one who did it should be punished, right? If the day of the trial came and the judge said, well, I want to have mercy on you. I want to have mercy on you as a wrongdoer. So I am going to pardon you. That would be mercy, right? The criminal would not have to serve the sentence. They would not be held accountable for their crime. But if it just ended there, it wouldn't be justice. Why wouldn't it be justice? Well, because the crime would go unpunished. The wrong would be unrighted, right? The sentence has got to be carried out. Imagine now that the judge wanting to show mercy and to do justice pardoned the criminal and laid the sentence on himself. As the one who is pardoning the criminal to show mercy, I am also going to serve that criminal sentence myself. That's justice. All right, that's what God has done in Jesus Christ. This is why the scripture says in Romans 3.26 that God is both just, he does justice, and he's the one who justifies. He makes sure that justice is done and he shows mercy, he justifies people, he declares them to be righteous, even though they're not, right, by doing both of these things. <clears throat> what we should understand is that God's justice and mercy have both been displayed in Christ. On the cross, sin has been fully punished, and believers in Christ are fully pardoned. Right? Does that make sense? Jesus Christ is the Lord Almighty. He is God over all, as Paul has just said in Romans 9, 5. He is the second person of the Trinity. He's the eternal and everlasting Son of God. God reveals Himself as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are one God. Right? If you'll remember our diagram from last week that I couldn't get to show up because the marker wasn't working. Right, God reveals himself as three persons who are one God. They've always existed together. They are equal in power, glory, authority, and eternity. They do everything together. They are three distinct persons who are one God. They cannot be separated from each other. They are eternally together in their divine union. They are one God. The Son is just as much God as the Father and the Spirit are. In the work of salvation, the Son has added everything to himself that it means to be a human person. He has actually become one of us in all respects. And he's done this while continuing to be fully and completely God. So the bottom line is God himself has given himself as an offering in our place. He has served our sentence, he has taken our guilt, he has paid the price of our sins, and it is completely up to him who he chooses to bring into his mercy. Meaning, where all of us deserve punishment, some of us receive mercy. It's not unjust when everybody who deserves to be punished is punished. It is merciful when some who deserve to be punished are pardoned. 
You see, <clears throat> Jesus explains this when he tells the story of the landowner who hired workers for his vineyard. I don't know if you guys remember this from Matthew 20. It's been a while since we were there. But if you are familiar with the scripture, there's a landowner who hired workers for his vineyard. When he was questioned at the end of the day about the wages that he was paying them, his answer was, isn't it my right what I do with my business? Right? It is completely God's right what he chooses to do. You see, we shouldn't take for granted that God has to show mercy because he doesn't have to. His desire is to show mercy because of his character. He is merciful and he will show mercy, but it's not a requirement of who he is that he has to. By the same token, we shouldn't be surprised when God does choose to show mercy. After all, Jesus came into the world to forgive sinners, just like you and just like me. And all those workers, if we'd go back to the story, all those workers, if you'd recall, were paid exactly the same wage, even those who had come in at the end of the day. Now, with that, let's move on to verses 19 through 29. Paul says, You'll say to me, therefore, why then does God still find fault? Who can resist his will? Let's pause for a moment because verse 19 is based on what Paul has just said in verse 18. God shows mercy to those he wants to, and he hardens those he wants to. Paul is again anticipating the objection that comes from that statement. Right? If God chooses to show mercy to some and he chooses to harden others, then how can anybody be held responsible, particularly if they're hardened, right? If God hardened them, it's not like it's their choice, is it? Well, going back to verse 18, it's helpful to see that in Exodus, we're told five times Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Five times then God held him in this hardness of heart. Five times God hardened it. What the Bible tells us is that God hardens people in the sense that he gives them over to what they've already chosen, what they have decided for themselves but also that not one of our choices is any kind of surprise to God. The reason for that is God knows everything. He's all-knowing. God has complete knowledge of all things, past, present, and future. Why is that? He's made the whole world. He has set this whole timeline uh, in motion, and He has known everything about it from beginning to end before He even started it. God has complete knowledge of all things, past, present, and future, and God's complete knowledge of all things extends to the future decisions that His free creatures are going to make. Prior to any of our decisions, God has predetermined His actions. Fully knowing every twist and turn of this world, every decision we'd make, every situation and circumstance that would exist, right? Uh, every life that he would create, God decided in advance everything he would make and everything he would do. And this is the exact world God has chosen. So it should be understood that neither God's choice to show mercy nor his hardening of people is based on what we do. But it also shouldn't be overlooked that God acts on people who are already lost in sin to save them. And his exclusion of some people from salvation is, in a sense, simply a confirmation of what they themselves have already chosen. There are two equal truths the Bible makes plain, and if we're going to do justice to the Scripture, we have to hold them both together. We can't throw one out for the other. Right? Those two truths are that God is sovereign, He is in complete control of all things, and that people are responsible for their choices. One of them doesn't negate the other. But it should also be remembered that we don't know the things God knows. We don't see the hearts of people as He does, and we don't know how God makes His decisions. So God's selection shouldn't drive us toward despair because the Bible tells us clearly that God will never refuse to accept or He will never cast away anyone who diligently seeks Him. Psalm 9, John 6, and many other places in the Bible tell us that. 
People, however, think in wrong ways. And we like to put ourselves in the position of judging God, evaluating what he does. This is what Paul deals with in verse 20 and and on, so let's pick back up there. But who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me this way? Or does the potter not have the right to make from the same lump of clay one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? So what if God, desiring to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of wrath ready for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on the objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory? On us, the ones he not only called from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Verse 24. Now let's stop there for a moment and look at a couple of things. Verse 20 is a quote of Job 33, 13. Who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Everyone hearing this is getting a reminder of where we came from and who made us, right? God is the creator. He took us from the dust of the earth. He gave us life. He gave us form. He gave us everything that we have and are. Completely at his will, at his discretion, We have no more right to question God than the clay does to question the potter. Now, I want to point out the scripture is getting us to think about something here, so we want to spend a little time on it. Has anybody ever made anything? Have you ever had one set of materials? All right. Have you ever had one set of materials and you made two different things from the same set of materials? I mean, it could be as simple as you had some paper and scissors and you cut out two different shapes, right? Wasn't it your choice what you made out of those materials? One to be one thing and one to be another thing? This is a word picture that Paul's using to illustrate that point, and then he carries it on to the proper end or the proper conclusion. Some are intended for glory, others are intended for wrath. Glory is a term that the Bible uses to describe the fullness of God's presence. To be in His glory is to be with Him in His fullness. The end result of salvation is exactly that. It's glorification. We are present with God fully and with all others who are in Him. Um, are his headphones not working anymore? They're okay. Okay. They're I got you. I just wanted to make sure if he wasn't able to hear that, you know, we didn't just keep running along. Yeah, so, <clears throat> right, the, the end result of salvation is glorification. Well, what is glorification? It's to be in the full presence of God along with all who are his. Uh, It's to be fully restored from sin and from all the effects of sin, right? We talked about some of these things earlier. Your soul is completely purified at death. Your body will be fully restored, made new, made incorruptible, made to live forever at the resurrection of the dead. When does that occur? That occurs at the end of the age when Jesus returns. Wrath is a term that the Bible uses to describe God's unending opposition to sin. To be under God's wrath is to be judged by God for sin and to be punished eternally by Him in hell. So what we should understand is a basic biblical truth. God is the creator. We have each been created. The scripture is clear, every one of us is going to meet our maker. Thanks for doing that, Erica. The scripture is clear that every one of us is going to meet our maker. We will all stand before Christ. We will all be judged by him. And it's to him that we must give an account of ourselves to others. We should be clear that 
Jesus is not going to be surprised on that day by where people go, who goes to the right and who goes to the left. All right? He knows everything. God, as the creator, has every right to do what he wants with his creation, with the things that he's made. And what we're being told here is that God, as creator, has not just sat back and watched. He's not just set things in motion and walked away. God is active in carrying out all that he has planned to do, all that he has prepared to do. Bringing the people into existence he's conceived of, calling those who are his, bearing patiently with those who are not, and all things, in all things, showing himself to be God. It brings us to the next point that I'd like for us to take a look at. God is in control. God is in control. That God is sovereign doesn't simply mean being in charge. It doesn't just mean he's the head honcho. It means that he is, I mean, he is, but it means also that he is in complete control of everything. Every event of this life, every situation that occurs, every life that he creates, and the destination of each soul. This is a truth that not everyone is fond of because people like to think that they've got more control than we actually do. That's one of the problems of sin, by the way. And this problem shapes how people think about God. Oh, God should give everyone a fair chance, right? He should look at all of the things that we do, and then he should make a decision, right? That's how people think about things. But the scripture is clear. God makes some for heaven and some for hell, and he decides that beforehand. People think that God should do things differently. They want a God who's more like themselves, right? Well, if I were God, I wouldn't allow hunger, If I were God, I wouldn't allow war. If I were God, I wouldn't allow injustice and suffering, nor would I send anybody to hell, right? That's, I don't know if that's what I would do if I were God, but those are the things I'm sure you've heard people say, right? Sometimes even Christians think like this. The bottom line is many people are looking for a God they can control, the one who will give them what they want, who will ease their pain, who will take away their suffering, who will bless them with a good life now. Very few people like the idea of who God actually is because you can't control him. Believing in a God you can't control is going to mean coming to terms with a reality that you might not like. You might not get what you want right now. This is also why there's such an interest in spiritism, in rocks, crystals, Reiki, tarot cards, psychics, horoscopes, you name it. Why? Even among people who claim to be Christians, why are so many folks interested in this stuff? Well, there's a reason. I want to know the future so I can take advantage of opportunities and I can avoid problems, right? I want to have a good life. I want to have a life that I can control. I want to have a life that doesn't bother me. I want to know that if I do this particular thing, then the spiritual force is going to have to do that particular thing, and I'm going to get what I want, like rubbing a bottle and the genie comes out and they have to grant your wish. I want you to know this is not the God of the Bible, and all of these things are just present-day idolatry and paganism. What we need to come to terms with as believers is we don't control God. He is in control of us. And we need to come more and more to recognize His control over this world and His control over our lives. But along with this, we need to see that God's actions aren't arbitrary. He doesn't do things willy-nilly. He's not like some despotic tyrant who's just up there on his heavenly throne, you know, cracking people over the head with his, uh, what is it, scepter, right? He's not just reacting and responding to things that people do out of uh, emotion, right? 
God truly is good, and everything he does is good. Nothing is random or haphazard. With God, everything is planned. God can be fully trusted because he has predetermined everything that he will do. He has announced it ahead of time in his word, and he doesn't deviate from it one bit. God does everything that he says. This should provide tremendous comfort for believers who are going through hard times, who are dealing with pain, difficulty, suffering, even loss, who are, you know, or are simply looking at the state of affairs in this world and wondering what's going to happen next. God's sovereignty means he not only has predetermined everything, but he actually has the power to do, to bring about everything that he has decided to do. So nothing should be in doubt. You know, if your hope is in this life, you're going to be constantly in flux. But if your eyes are set on the hope that we have in eternity, then you will be able to deal with the ups and downs of this life because you understand it may be a bumpy ride on the aircraft, right, as Jim likes to say, but you will have a safe landing when you get there. The Jewish believers in Paul's day wondered if something was wrong. I want to bring your, our attention back to this. They wondered if something was wrong. Why are so few Jews being saved and so many Gentiles are? Has God abandoned his promise to his people? Is he doing something different than he said he would do in his word? And if that's happening, then how can we trust his promises in Christ? Did his plans change? In response, Paul directs his listeners back to God's word. In verses 25 through 29, Paul quotes two Old Testament passages to show this is exactly what God always said he would do. In verses 25 and 26, Paul quotes Hosea chapters 2 and 1 respectively, and then in 27 through 29, he quotes from Isaiah chapters 10 and 28. Concerning the large number of Gentiles coming to Christ, Paul shows this was already told about in Hosea when God said, I will call a people my people who are not my people. I will call them beloved who are unloved. In the place where they are, were told, you're not my people, they will be called sons and daughters of the living God. Concerning the small number of Jews who are coming to Christ, while the large number refuses him, Paul shows Isaiah talked about this. Though the number of Israel's sons is very large, right, like the sand on the seashore, only the remnant, a small number, will be saved. The Lord will execute his sentence on the earth. In other words, he will judge sin completely and decisively. And if the Lord had not left us offspring, if the Lord had not left us children, if the Lord had not preserved this small number, we'd have none. We'd all have been wiped out totally like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The point here is that God's doing everything he said he would do. And it should be no surprise to see what's happening because it's exactly what he has said in his word. Now, your situation today might not be confusion over who's being saved and who isn't. I mean, it might be. But whatever it is, I would encourage you to rely on God's word. It's the lens that he has given us to know him and to be able to understand this world for what it is. Just to take a moment on this before we move on, this world can be a confusing place. But God's word shows us clearly what it is and what to expect from it, as well as what to expect from him. You may wonder why bad things happen, why evil seems to go unpunished, uh, this might seem to conflict with the idea of God as loving and powerful, right? Verse 23 tells us that God is bearing with these things so that those who are His may know the riches of His glory. If you didn't see evil, would you know what it is? If you didn't experience injustice, would you know what's wrong with it? 
If you didn't go through what's bad, would you be able to appreciate what's good? Would you know the riches of God's mercy? Would you know the extent of his love? Would you know why he's good and it's good to do what he says? I think we all should be challenged to see that God has foreknown and allowed all of these things for our good, for the good of his children, just like Romans 8, 29 through 30 tells us, or 28 through 30 tells us. I think we, um, <clears throat> we should be challenged to understand that because we need to know why God is better than this life. We need to know why we should want him more than we want this world. God's word shows us that he hates these things too, worse than we do. And as he patiently bears with what he hates in the world, we shouldn't forget that he is also patiently born with what he hates in each of us. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross can be scarcely understood apart from God's hatred of sin. Uh, We must know the wrath of God. We must know his fierce anger, not only against what's wrong, but against people who do wrong things, evildoers, if we're ever going to appreciate the depth of God's love for us. The image in Hosea is an adulterous wife whom God calls beloved. And he's referring to his people. The children born of her union with that wife are also what Hosea is talking about. And God calls those children who are not his, mine. Just as God's mercy and justice are displayed side by side on the cross, so are God's love and wrath. As Christ took our sins within his own body on that tree, we should understand that God has borne with everything that he hates, right, in order to produce what he loves. All right, with that, let's continue on to the final set of verses here, 30 through 33, and we'll wrap up for today. What should we say then? Gentiles who didn't pursue righteousness have obtained it, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel, pursuing the law for righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Well, because they didn't pursue it by faith, but they pursued it as if it were from works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over. Yet the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. Hmm. Again, I want to point out that Paul is responding to the question of how so many Jews have missed salvation, but all these Gentiles have found it. The Jews know that God's word is what's necessary for faith, that no one can come to faith in God unless they receive his revelation through his word. They have to hear the word of God to come to faith. So the question then is, how can so many Jewish people who not only have God's word, but they're actually trying to do what it says, how is it that they ended up not being saved? How did they miss the boat, right? The answer Paul gives is the Jews were not pursuing God by faith, but they were pursuing God by their own works. They had turned his law into a way to check boxes, say, look at all the good things I've done. Shouldn't I be saved? Instead of trusting that God needed to do the work to save them, and they had to rely on him. Right. In this section, Paul is contrasting two kinds of righteousness. Righteousness that comes from faith in Christ because God gives you a right standing with him. Justification means that God declares you to be right even though you're not. It comes from his word. It comes from him saying it. It comes from him deciding it. Right. So there's this righteousness that was obtained through faith, and then there's this righteousness that was worked for that didn't come from faith. You might call that self-righteousness. Look at what I do. 
Aren't I so great? Aren't I so pleasing? Shouldn't I be exalted because of it? Paul again points them to the Scriptures for understanding. Verse 33 is a quote of Isaiah 8 and 28. God said ahead of time that Israel would stumble. What they would stumble over was Him. Jesus is the rock who was laid in Zion. God often called Himself their rock or the rock of their salvation, and Jesus used this passage many times concerning Himself, talking directly to Israel's leaders about their rejection of Him and that God had said ahead of time in His Word that they would see Him and they wouldn't recognize Him and they would stumble over Him or they would fall, they would miss the mark. The Jews, by and large, would stumble over Jesus because they would not recognize their need for His righteousness, a righteousness that they can't produce, that they can't create. That's because they felt confident in their own righteousness. They thought, we have the law and we know what God wants, and we do what God wants, so shouldn't He accept us because of that? Paul has already said in Romans 3.20, no one is saved by the works of the law. And again, in Romans 5.20, he said the law was given to reveal sin. It was given so that the full extent of sin would be known. It was God's moral and righteous standard, and it had the effect of revealing what is wrong with us. It multiplied the trespasses. The law should have had the effect of showing even the most devout Jew, even the most law-abiding Jew, I can't do it all. As much good as I do at every turn, I find that I'm still doing bad. Paul describes this in Romans 7, what it's like, right? Not only for Jews, but for Christians. At every turn, I'm falling short. So what happened is the majority of self-righteous Jews neglected to see the one thing that the law should have pointed out to them. You're a sinner in need of God's mercy. You know, it's from this point that people come to faith, and it's, from, it's on the basis of faith that God exclusively accepts people. Faith comes from recognizing your sinfulness. It comes from recognizing God's holiness. That's how you see your sinfulness. Seeing that will bring you to a place of repentance, which is a true, it's, it's true contrition. It's a sorrow of heart. It's grief for the wrong things that you've done and a true turn away from sin and toward God. You know, as the Lord said in Isaiah 66, the people I value are not proud. They are sorry for the wrong things they have done and they have great respect for my word. The Gentiles didn't have as big a problem seeing their sin when the message of Jesus came to them, when the word of God came to them. They couldn't say, but look at all the good things I'm doing. Or, I'm all right because I go to synagogue each week. Or, I put my money in the plate and I serve on that ministry team, so I'm fine. And it brings us to the final point that I'd like to make today, which is this. Human works don't save. The scripture is clear about this cover to cover. Human works don't save. The only work that saves is the work of God. Not one of us, through our own efforts, can achieve a right standing with God. God is the one who declares sinners to be righteous, not based on anything they've done, but based on entirely on what He has done in Christ. Now, I want to make a point here. That's not to say that what you do doesn't matter. Christians are supposed to do good works. They are supposed to come as a result of their salvation, just as Jews were supposed to do good works. They were to come as a result of their salvation, right? But it was never an exchange of what you do for salvation. You know, why do you think Jesus said, on that day, many will come to me and they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this in your name and didn't I do that in your name? And I'll say, away from me, you evildoer, for surely I never knew you. Well, anybody who says I'm here because of what I've done has the wrong idea. So what's important to understand is I can't earn my way into heaven. I can't outweigh the bad with the good. 
I can't substitute my works for God's work in me. And I can't get what I want from God by doing what He wants. You know, the problem Paul's pointing out is the same one the Bible continually exposes. Human works are an attempt to place our demands on God. God, if I do this for you, then you have to do that for me. If I give you what you want, then you have to give me what I want. I want to be saved, so I'm going to do this and you have to save me. The Jews were, in effect, trying to manipulate God through their good works. That's what Paul is pointing out. It helps here to look closely at how Paul has worded things in these couple of verses. Verse 30, the Gentiles obtained, in other words, they achieved, they received. The Gentiles obtained the righteousness that comes from faith. The Jews pursued, they sought after, but they didn't catch up to Right? The Jews pursued the law for righteousness, yet they failed to obtain it. Verse 31, the Gentiles understood their sinfulness and they had faith in God to forgive them, and He forgave them and gave them a right standing. In the same way that the Jews who came to Christ understood their sinfulness and they trusted God to forgive them, and He gave them a right standing. The Jews who Paul is talking about here are the Jews who tried to obtain righteousness through their own efforts. They pursued, but they did not achieve what they were after. The failure of most Jews then was not actually doing what's right. It wasn't pursuing righteousness, but it was their attempt to make God indebted to them through their activities. In other words, the problem wasn't trying to do what God said. The problem was trying to make God owe them because of what they were doing. Does that make sense? This, by the way, is give to get, something Jim likes to talk about. God doesn't give to get, right? It's not how God operates. We have no leverage over God. He needs nothing from us, and He doesn't owe us anything. All our works are like filthy rags compared to the righteousness of God. Does anybody remember that from the scripture? The work, the works that he that that he does in us, those are his, not ours. They're the ones that he has prepared in advance so that we may walk in them. So there's nothing that we can claim as our own. You can't say, I did this to get here, or I deserve that from God. I think this speaks a strong word to those among us who knowingly or not are trying to do the same thing. It may not be observing the laws of Moses, but you need to think, what are you doing where the thought in your mind is, if I just do this for God, then He's going to have to do that for me. The fact of the matter is, if God never does another thing for you, He's already done enough, and you have reason to be eternally thankful for Him. If there's one thing that Jesus has made clear, we are debtors who cannot pay our debts. And to come to Christ, you must recognize your spiritual bankruptcy, that you are in His debt, not the other way around. So, as we close today, I'd like each of us to consider our relationship to Jesus. Do you see Him as Lord? Do you see Him as Lord over all? And do you see yourself as being in His debt rather than Him being in yours? All right. Let's think about those things. And uh, we'll have a final song uh, as we wrap up today.
That's a good one. Well, as we uh, bring this part of our gathering to a close, just a couple things I want to mention. Uh, For those who are sticking around for prayer and discussion, we're going to do that in about 10 minutes uh, after we wrap things up here. So about 11.30, uh, we'll come back for about 30 minutes or so, and we'll just discuss uh, our thoughts and reflections uh, from the Scripture today and and pray together. So if you'd like to stick around for that, anybody's welcome to do it. Uh, But just for the folks who normally do, uh, about 10 minutes from now. Um, The other thing is, if you brought a gift today, and you're wondering, well, what should I do with this? Because the plate didn't come by. Um, There's a plate on the right on your way out. You can put anything you'd like to in there. And, um, oh, and the other thing I want to make sure that I mention. So we will begin meeting at the Ramada just down the road in two weeks, September 26th. We have a room, a meeting room there, and uh, same time for everything. 10 o'clock for worship, uh, 9 o'clock, 9.15 for breakfast uh, over at the Ramada. Uh, That's where we are going to be for the interim period until we move into our new space. Um, You know, for anybody who doesn't know, we sold this property. Uh, We're moving out uh, in a couple of weeks, and we have acquired the old Radio Shack and music store in Nags Head uh, across from the hospital. We have some work to do to the inside of it to get it ready. Um, So it's going to be a few months for that to take place. The interim period, we're going to be at the Ramada. It's a great setup. Uh, It's very much like this room right here. Uh, So September 26th, uh, we're going to be meeting there. That's where we'll be every week uh, until we're in the new place. All right, so with that, uh, that brings, again, uh, this part of our time to a close. Uh, Would somebody like to... Uh, uh, to close things with prayer. I just give thanks to God for for everything today. Anybody can do it. Thanks, Heath. Father, we're just so grateful for who you are and how much you love us and how much you've done for us to show that love. Lord, as Errol said this morning, you have done everything, God, everything. Even if you don't do anything else for us, you've done everything to make it possible for us to be in a relationship with you. Lord, but we still have an action. We still have a part to play in receiving of that free gift of grace that you've given to us. We have to choose to accept it. We have to choose to follow you by uh, growing deeper and deeper in relationship with you, by getting to know you through your word, by allowing your spirit to change us Uh, from the inside out. So Lord, I I just pray, God, as we think about what's been said today, as we think about the Scripture we've read through today, and uh, how, Lord, we're still, a lot of us uh, who are here on the earth today are still struggling with some of the same questions Paul has addressed clearly. So Lord, as as we uh, think about that, as we uh, reminisce on it, God, we just pray that You'll show our hearts and show our minds God, exactly the answers we need from your word. We thank you again for uh, always being with us, not just today, but everywhere we go. For those who are believers, God, you are there with us. And we thank you for that. So, Lord, help us to be a light in your community. Help us to be uh, reaching those who are lost in this community, in this part of your world. God, help us to be making disciples of those who come in to your fold. We thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to worship and to want after you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name.